Um, welcome to everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening in some cases. Um, this is Ima Subirats. I'm from, um, I'm working in the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and I'm going to moderate uh, the session dedicated to best practices part two. Uh, today we have uh, six speakers that will present very interesting presentations. I hope that you will be um, excited about uh, all the content that is going to be shared today here. And uh, every presentation is going to have about 50 minutes. And after that, we can have five minutes for questions and answers that you can use the chat uh, any time that you can leave the questions during even the talk. Um, and you can also leave comments and uh, through the questions that, that and answers channel. If you decide to use the channel, be, be aware that you can also be anonymously publishing there. It's a little bit up to your discretion. Uh, but definitely, uh, you can also leave comments on the chat. And you can also, as well, vote for your favorite speakers, which is quite exciting is the first time I do so. Let's see how it works. Don't uh, make any vote against the moderator. <laughs> so it's going to be uh, my first uh, moderated session here in Dublin Core. So said that and saying welcome to those that are joining still. Um, we are going to welcome the first speaker. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Daniel Martini from KTVL. Association for Technology and Structures in Agriculture from Germany. Uh, Daniel has studied agricultural sciences at the University of Hohenheim in Germany and is now working mainly in projects and initiatives dealing with information management in agriculture, focusing on the usage of semantic web technologies. Daniel is going to present the, <clears throat> the presentation about metadata usage in agriculture challenges and solution approaches within a domain of domains. Welcome, Daniel. Uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ima. So I will quickly share my screen with you. So you should now see the presentation. Well, when I when I was first asked uh, to to do a talk at the Dublin Core Conference, uh, I I was in fact a, a bit reluctant because well Dublin Core is quite high level and uh, well a rather rather generic metadata standard, whereas the uh, stuff that we are doing is is really well uh, let's say let's say quite close to to concrete problems or applications of agriculture. And therefore Dublin Core is actually only, only a small, small part of the whole picture. But, but then I thought a little bit about it and thought, well, maybe, maybe perhaps that is exactly the point that could be presented today of how, how we make use of, of Dublin Core uh, within a larger framework. And yeah, in fact, this is, what I would like to, to illustrate now a little bit to you. So, so if we look first at the challenges that we're facing in agriculture, there are, there are actually quite a few. Uh, one of the challenge, uh, I think most of you are aware of this, we have, a, we have, a, have an increasing population on the earth. So it's estimated that by 2050, we will have 10 billion people on the planet. And yeah, they, they will need to get some food somehow. Uh, so, so this is in fact one of the challenges, even while the growth rate is currently, currently falling. Uh, nevertheless, population is still growing. So, so this will be one of the one of the key challenges still uh, to agriculture to really provide enough food. On the other hand, well, one of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations is, is zero hunger. And if you look at this chart, uh, you can see that, well, unfortunately, since about 2017, 2018, the number of people who are undernourished in the world uh, actually is rising again. 
Uh, and in fact, yeah, this is up to 20, uh, 2021. So I'm not sure even if you take into account this year, the numbers might even, even go up further. So in fact, there are more and more people, well, being, being undernourished uh, currently. Another challenge that we face in agriculture, well, of course, uh, everybody is aware of, of climate change. And, and this is a map which presents the change in agricultural productivity between 2003 and uh, the 2080s. And uh, well, whereas, well, in, in fact, there are a few areas on the planet which, which might benefit from climate change, actually. So these are the green parts in the Northern Hemisphere mainly. But there is really a large proportion uh, around the equ equatorial area where, where really um, yeah, depressions of productivities of around 25% have to be expected. Uh, so, so in total, this will really, really challenge us because in total, yeah, there will be on a global scale, a loss of productivity in the future. Of course, this is a model and it's all with a certain, well, uncertainty. Uh, nevertheless, I think, yeah, it will be quite, quite a big challenge to organize the distribution of food uh, towards areas where, where less will be produced due to climate change. And then these are some excerpts from the European Commission, uh, the farm to fork strategy actually, um, where, where they make some statements on, on the inputs that you can use for doing agricultural production. And the key parts are marked in yellow here. So the, the European Commission actually demands to reduce the, the use of chemical pesticides by around 50% by 2030. And also we have excess application of nutrients and, and uh, lots of nutrient losses towards the groundwater. And this is also to be reduced by 50%. And well, the goal is clear. Of course, these chemicals have a certain impact on the environment and, and this is to be reduced as well. So, so on the input side towards production, there is also, also a demand uh, to reduce the inputs. And if you look at this uh, in a summary, uh, in the end, well, agriculture needs to produce enough food for everybody. And this within a rapidly changing environment. And unfortunately, this environment is not changing towards our advantage, but rather, rather the opposite. And uh, at the same time, um, farmers are to apply less inputs using less resources to really minimize the detrimental impact on the environment. And if you think about it from the economics perspective, in the end, this means producing more output with less input. Well, which in principle is, is kind of squaring the circle. And the question is how we can achieve this. And well, uh, uh, personally, I believe there are quite some limits regarding technical progress. So for example, well, you could say go for bigger machinery, but, but at least in Central Europe, this is not possible due to the, to, the, to the traffic regulations. So the machines can't get any bigger to increase productivity. Also, well, application of chemicals is limited. Uh, so, so what can we do in the end? And, and well, I'm far from being a proponent for digitization will solve everything and things like that. But nevertheless, I think, well, uh, how, we, how we manage knowledge in agriculture will really, really play a key role in, in solving, solving these, these problems and, um, and challenges. And if you think about knowledge, well, knowledge in the end uh, relies on, on reasoning on something and that something usually is information and data. So, so you cannot derive new knowledge from nothing, 
but instead, yeah, we, we really need good data sources, good information sources, and, and yeah, uh, to really be able to solve these problems in the future. And this is in fact where I think metadata and data description comes in. Uh, nevertheless, I want to, to also give you a short overview of the data types that we're dealing with in agriculture. So, so from the approach that we might take in the future to tackle the challenges, uh, there is this uh, the idea around agrosystems research. And in fact, agrosystems research uh, is looking at whole systems of agricultural production. Uh, at different scales and also modeling the plant, soil and environment interactions and so on. So in this way, it's kind of yeah, taking into account also complex relationships between processes and things like that. So, so this is rather, well, I would say it's really a knowledge intensive job to do this kind of research. And, and if you look at it, well, it's an, it's an overlap of several different subjects and domains. So you have to deal with plant science, you have to deal with soil science, uh, the environment and landscape plays a role. You have to look at data in different scales. So this goes right down to the level of single genes and plants and how they develop. Uh, then up towards crop trials, um, towards a farm field. Well, and in the end, you also have to cover whole regions, uh, even whole countries in your analysis. So, so also the level of scale that you have in data sets uh, actually differs a lot. And then we have different data categories. Uh, so we're often dealing with time series data, like, well, this could also be market data in agriculture, for example. Then geospatial data plays a large role. Uh, and uh, we have also uh, in the recent years, uh, lots, of, lots of sensor devices, for example, on, on farming machinery and, and on the fields, which is subsumed under the term farming 4.0. But we also have sensitive data, uh, personal data. There's also lots of legacy data available. And, and well, the omics data is actually on the level of genes and proteins and things like that. So there's quite a, quite a lot of different data categories in the end to be integrated to enable, enable that kind of, of research. So if you look at it in more technical terms, and maybe this is getting closer uh, towards, well, a real metadata description or, of data. So, so we have, for example, tabular data that could be market time series, usually in CSV files. We have relational database export. There are structured and semi-structured data in various formats. Uh, for example, the standard for agricultural machinery data exchange uh, relies on relies on on XML. Also, the geospatial uh, data standards from the OGC use XML, and well, there are quite a few other other formats and data sets provided in that format. Then of course we have imagery data, remote sensing, for example, GeoTIFF files. We have video data from capturing workflow processes, for example, for plant road tracking. Also 3D models more recently play, play an increasing role for well, uh, following plant growth, for capturing phenotypical data, also landscape models. Uh, then, of course, well, the traditional text data like publications and with recent uh, progress in artificial intelligence, you often also have to label or annotate the data to, to make machine learning algorithms in the end uh, yeah, able to learn from the data. So this is more yeah, uh, the technical point of view. And if you look at it, what this means from the, from the metadata point of view, 
Well, uh, this is a rough illustration of an imagery data set as we use it, for example, in the AgriGaia project. So this is a project dealing with artificial intelligence applications uh, in agriculture within the um, Gaia-X European cloud infrastructure. And if you look at, at this data set, well, there is on the data set level, a certain amount of metadata. There is a provider, for example, or a publishing date for the data set. Then you might have a data subset uh, about, about where providing themes or the purpose or former usage of a data subset. Then, then so this might be a group of images, for example, concerned with agricultural machinery. Then of course you have the raw images, which also contain metadata. And uh, usually for machine learning applications, you have the labels or annotations. So basically this is marking a certain area in the image and then giving, giving a concept annotation or a tag or a keyword to it so that machine learning algorithms can learn uh, what can be seen on the picture. And also these annotations um, have certain metadata, for example, the software tool that has been used to create the annotation. Uh, there might be a person involved who has drawn these, these rectangles on the images and things like that. And in the end, well, in this example, it shows a linkage towards uh, towards concepts in a controlled vocabulary, which in fact are a tractor and the plow. But yeah, basically this can be yeah, any, any imagery content. And the interesting part here is you cannot easily differentiate what is data and what is metadata. And also the metadata can move between the different levels. Uh, so for example, if all images are of the same format, uh, in the same size, uh, then also this, this data field might move up in the hierarchy uh, towards another, another resource or another object. Uh, so, so in principle, this is, well, requires a rather flexible structure in the end. And the question, well, if you look at agriculture as a whole is uh, how do you standardize metadata that can have an arbitrary breadth and depth well, and the answer is, uh, I think you don't uh, because you can't, because it takes human agreement and that will take lots of time and it will be very difficult. And the other point is, I think what we need mo is, is mostly already existing. And well, that is the point I will illustrate shortly now. So I won't go into detail on how this is enabled. I probably most of you are familiar with the RDF based data model and, and know that it is very easy to flexibly combine different RDF vocabularies. And in fact, this is also what we did in the AgriGaia project. So this roughly illustrates the different namespaces that we have been using in the data catalog. So there are some namespaces concerned with the general base model. Uh, we have very generic data descriptions and provenance data. And here actually uh, Dublin Core comes into play. Uh, we want to express policies and access rights on data set for that we use ODRL. The annotations I have already explained a little bit. Uh, so there is also a vocabulary around this then we have a set of data type specific descriptive data, for example, for EXIF text in images or for rows and columns in CSV files. There is some part uh, and some namespaces concerned with geospatial data. For people, organizations and products, uh, we used the well-known FOF, VCART and schema.org namespaces. We do validation and as it's a Gaia-X project, of course, also a few of the Gaia-X ontologies are used, which mainly are concerned with uh, yeah, describing computing resources. And there are a number of controlled vocabularies and thesauri, uh, for example, Acrovoc is used for concept assignment uh, for, for the themes and topics. And we have the GeoNames ontology for geospatial names and stuff. 
And, and in the end, well, uh, it's quite a challenge to have so many vocabularies and uh, you probably need, need some kind of design patterns to help you staying organized. And uh, there are quite a few initiatives around design patterns. Some are sleeping currently, but uh, yeah, one thing I want to shortly show you is two patterns that we actually use in the data. Uh, from the from the linked data patterns book by Lay Dots and Ian Davis. So that is the pattern link not label. So how mm -hmm. can we benefit? You have two minutes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. How do you how do you model a data set to maximize the benefits of a graph based model? And well, the solution is to ensure that you really model everything as a resource. So, so what does this mean? So these are the namespace prefixes. And as a short example, uh, I have here, well, let's describe the data, let's describe the data set as a, as a, at a first glance. And then we can, for example, use Dublin core to, to add a subject term to it. So here we do this using an RDF literal, uh, but I think there is a more elegant way to do it. So a uh, decad theme, in the data catalog vocabulary is described as a subproperty of DC term subject and has a range of a SCOS concept. So, so, and this is in fact provided elsewhere, these statements, namely in the DCAT vocabulary. And that way we can then assign a SCOS concept to, to the DCAT theme property. And the nice thing is this statement will then be inferred from the subproperty relation. So we can remove this one. And now you say, okay, but wait, where is this nice human readable label gone? Nobody knows what C25768 means. This is in fact also provided elsewhere by linking to the concept. We can then in fact use all the relations and properties uh, from the Acrovoc thesaurus, uh, which also includes of course the labels. So in the end, what do we gain? Uh, we have a explicit strong suggestions to use controlled vocabularies. Uh, we only provide one property, which is the DCAT theme and the other one, the DC term subject will be inferred automatically. And we benefit from, from Acrovox relations, for example, the multilingual labels, narrower concepts and things like that. Yeah, maybe quickly one last pattern. That's the literal keys pattern. That's also typical for agriculture. There are quite a few legacy coding systems, for example, for crops, for varieties, for pesticides. And this leaves, leaves us with the question of how we publish non-global identifiers in RDF. So in fact, there is also a design pattern from this book from, from Leigh and Davis that I cited. Uh, and this is, we create a custom property, which will be a sub property of the DC terms identifier property. And then you use this property to annotate uh, the data. So I have sketched here a few examples of a pesticide, which has a pesticide registration number and this property actually will be subproperty of DC terms identifier. Same here with two examples from crop code data sets. And the advantages you gain, you query for properties with identifying Kekka character simply by querying for any property which is subproperty of DC terms identifier. You can assign specific classes or you can even restrict these properties more by, by using OWL. So, and that's, well, finally, uh, all that I wanted to present to you for today, there would be a lot more design patterns that we actually used in, in modeling the data sets, but I'll leave it at that at the moment. Uh, and I think the key part here is really, we need easy ways to combine data standards if we're dealing with a complex interdisciplinary cross-domain setting, RDF can, can provide that. And uh, you can do most of the things, in my observation at least, uh, by, by using existing things or extending. 
So there is actually no need to, to pull out new standards and things like that because most of, of it can be built up on existing RDF vocabularies. Nevertheless, usage is still, still kind of a demand to, to developers of applications. So I think yeah, it's a bit time to focus on providing usage examples, hints, and patterns. And with that final, well, uh, let's say pledge, um, I, I will finish. And yeah, uh, thanks for, for uh, listening. And yeah, any questions? I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Daniel. And I would like to introduce our next speaker is John Antil. He's currently a knowledge management, knowledge manager at US Army Expeditionary Workforce. John holds a master's of science in knowledge management from Kansas State University and a master of certified knowledge management from the KM Institute. All our speakers have a long bio that you can uh, check on the web just that we run out of time in our session and I'm just being very brief. So John, over to you. Thank you so much for being here today. All right, thank you very much, ma'am. So today we're gonna to talk about uh, best practices and lessons learned databases versus actually changing them and the SOPs as they're identified. So first off, we're going to go off some definitions, of course. Capturing lessons learned should be an ongoing effect. And the problem is with this, they get mothballed into large databases and then no one actually reads them. So I like to learn from failure first. So Harvard Business Review in 2010, they've done some case studies. These three that are very good. They show that how even though you fail, you can learn from it. Now, why do I show this stuff? Um, because these are lessons learned and they're most people haven't even heard of them. And there's actually some very good information in them. So then again, I also am part of the search culture. The And so I went to a few different areas and the one from the army this is one that everybody can access. They're the publicly accessible ones. Um, there's thousands of lessons learned that never get read. So now this is starting to show how much information has started to become an intangible asset in cost to a company. This includes employee retention, turnover, but this also includes those lesson learned databases and your SOPs. So what is a good SOP? It's something that's quick, it's very easy to use, and it helps everything within that area. So a good SOP will help your audience and it will be easy to read. So keep them short, keep them simple. And then the types of SOPs that you guys will be familiar with are checklists, which are self-explanatory. Those step-by-step -step guides for those of us who can't work the computer. Um, and so somebody else has to create a way for us to do it. We are all familiar with a hierarchical list and flow charts. And then the other type of SOPs are a book, which is the most common in the military. So why do I say we have issues with SOPs? Um, this is everything that I could find that people have said that their SOPs lack. They're stuck in one department. They don't get shared. They are only available on the internal server. We don't trust the information and management doesn't trust us to actually write it. So different things help change these SOPs into what you're looking for. A good SOP will advance every section of your company. Um, so it's going to help the safety aspect by pointing out, hey, we painted all our 
overhead doors that are under six foot yellow so that way people wouldn't hit their heads on them. Uh, they are going to stop the miscommunication of, well, that was John's job. And John goes, well, no, no, I'm not sure about that. Regulatory guidance. If we haven't ever read that, um, you could normally bring your regulatory guidance for a single area down quite a bit so they don't actually have to go and look into it and spend hours reading 500 page document. SOPs will also streamline your workflows when you're working with them. Um, so who does what and where. This is particularly helpful when you're working with workflows and that are actually de data dependent on the systems. The accountability, I can never stress this one enough. Who is responsible for what? And in any organization, we all know it's always the other guy's fault. So a way that we can improve our SOPs and our list is through um, an after action review. And the after action review is a blameless design to enable us to talk about the exact object or period of time in question. Um, they are very, very well if done properly. And if done improperly, they still can help you. Um, this isn't, hey, give me three or four areas that are good and we'll work on. No, this is actually an in-depth review of how something happens. So it's an open and honest discussion on what went wrong and what went right. Uh, focuses on everyone. And I do mean everyone. So the one guy in the corner who just answers your phones, he's impacted whenever you guys do something large or even small. It focuses on a specific period of time or an event or a project. And this is key because you don't want to do an after action review on something that's huge. And then identify ways to sustain what was done well. This is the key right there. This is when we're going to change our standard operating procedures and, our, and make them into an active system. Because if we keep them in a lesson learned database, no one ever goes back and checks them. Uh, checked and verified this, that less than 1% of the Army actually uses the Army Center of Lesson Learned. Most of the companies, people are questioning if they actually have one. So, this helps get at the database question of what do we store in our lessons learned area and how do we, we can improve our SOPs from that aspect. So this is just going to be a quick case study at Joint Force Headquarters Cyber. Um, I was the knowledge manager in charge for all of the knowledge at Joint Force Headquarters Cyber um, for many years. So we had a current operations cell and they continuously got new people in and removed people once they got good at the job because then they were able to be used in other departments. Um, part of this caused a lot of actions to be missed. Um, the SOPs were very wordy and very hard for someone to actually look through. Time to proficiency on this one was about 30 days. So that's a lot of time for somebody coming into a high, high speed area and then having about a rotation out in three months. So what we did was we moved the SOP and their lessons learned over to a Microsoft product info path and created basically a binder. So every month they'd copy it and re-go and it'd work. They copied the latest one because as they worked through their, pro their policies and processes, they identified them and changed them. So the time to proficiency went down from a month down to three days because they had the most active information and they could actually get to it easier. Zero suspense times were missed because they were all looking at the same page. You had 
army captains and majors and lieutenant colonels looking at the same information that the lieutenant had. All right, so in the end, what does that really mean? Why do we need to look at what's in our lessons learned database and actually change them out to our active use? This is something that we have to work on as a company or as a person, because if we don't start moving these items from the closets and bring them out into the sunlight, all those really good valuable tools and lessons learned that you have received throughout the years are going to not be shown. They're not going to be searched and that's proven. Um, even if you do the project management where they have to go into the lesson learned database, they have to identify three lessons that were relevant to their new case. So stuff like that is things that we need to look at. So after that, we really don't have anything else. So any questions? Thank you, John. Um, I think that our next speaker is actually Florian. So um, Florian Krautli. He's a specialized in knowledge representation and data visualization for digital cultural data. He's based at the Swiss Art Research Infrastructure at the University of Zurich and will present their joint work on semantic data for cultural collections. Over to you, Florian. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you. I think Nishad will actually play my presentation, uh, especially because my internet is a bit choppy today. So. Uh, you have the presentation recorded and I'll be back live for questions for other demonstrations. Uh, yeah, I'm on it. Okay, thank you. No worries, I made it nine minutes, so I have one minute for uh, setting it up. No, I don't see, I have no audio. Problem with the audio? No, there's no audio. Okay. Frank, could you try to play from your side? 
And yes, I can give it a go, just a second. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about knowledge graph applications for cultural collections. And I'm going to talk about the promises of this technology, uh, the issues uh, that we encounter and the reality, how we put those into practice. So what is the core promise of uh, linked open data? Institutions like museums, libraries, and archives all catalog their holdings within their own databases. In addition, they use domain-specific metadata standards to catalog their data, and they are not necessarily compatible with each other. So cultural data ends up in individual silos held by their respective institutions. And linked data could bridge these silos by identifying and connecting individual pieces of data within those databases using URIs. If you can somehow agree on using the same URIs for identifying the same things, linked data could also enable us to discover resources on a certain topic by querying multiple databases with the URI, for example, for Isaac Gerardini. Without having to know the structure or cataloging standards of individual cultural collection, this could bring up database entries on the Mona Lisa in the museum collection or references on Leonardo da Vinci in a library catalog. Linked data or more fashionable knowledge graphs also allow to shift focus and, and that is often required when doing research. Cultural data is usually cataloged from a perspective of the individual work. So work that has a, a title, a technique, an artist or a subject. In a linked data environment, it's possible, for example, to shift from, uh, from individual work to a network. So to focus on individual artifacts and hypothesize on the relationship between them. How can we fulfill those promises? I mentioned how we want to link data with URIs. That sounds uh, simple enough, but which URIs do we actually choose? And here we have two main concerns. We have to describe uh, the meaning of the data and the shape of the data, and we have to identify individual entities. So on the one hand, it's about shared data models, and on the other hand, about shared reference data. And we tackle both uh, in our applications. The first one we address in our sorry reference data models. And this is really for enabling shared description of cultural data. They are available for a number of entities that we usually find uh, in cultural data sets. The models themselves are based on CDOC CRM and its extensions. For example, we use uh, FRBROO for geographic data or CRM Ditch for a description of digital provenance data. And the models themselves are also compatible with linked art. So we don't create uh, competing models there, um, but models that maybe uh, also cover the use cases there that are specifically not addressed by linked art. And on the website, uh, we find uh, the documentation as well as individual modeling examples. For example, here we see how we model uh, birth and death dates and places uh, for an individual person. The second issue, the one of uh, identification of entities, uh, we facilitate through the SARI reference data service. And this provides uh, in uh, kind of single access points to multiple reference data sets. Uh, on the one hand, via kind of web-based front end that we see here in the screenshot. On the other hand, via uh, lookup API. And this API implements the, the draft of the W3C reconciliation API. Uh, it means it can be used with applications that, that implement this, uh, for example, open refine. Uh, and what we also support is adding new reference data. Um, and this is, for example, in a scenario where we discover 
uh, entities in, in your archive, in your collections that do not exist yet in any other reference data. Uh, you can contribute uh, those, but you can also contribute uh, data that links to existing uh, entities. And this is then a mechanism that we use to discover uh, the same entities across collections. So the link data promise is that, you know, you can go from one and links to everything else. Uh, in reality, it's often that uh, individual collections and data and reference data services only link to specific ones. So, for example, uh, many link to uh, Wikidata, uh, but not to ULAN. Um, and what we do in, in uh, RDS, in reference data service, is we make use of those links to establish uh, additional links between entities that are not directly linked to each other. So this is one fulfillment of the linked data promise that you know uh, data that links to the same entities can be discovered as a whole. Now, does this actually work? Following the paradigm of eat your own dog food, we also use our own services and models. And in particular, in this uh, project, which is still in development about uh, images of Switzerland. And it is already public. Uh, I, can, I can only share the link and the slides. And it is a knowledge graph of historical images of Switzerland, which originate from uh, three different cultural collections. Uh, the Central Library of Zurich, uh, the National Library of Switzerland, and the Familie Fehlmann Foundation. And we receive this data in a variety of formats. So we have a uh, MARC XML, uh, custom XML formats, uh, as well as Excel sheets. Uh, so it's both in terms of how the data is structured as well as uh, the data uh, types itself. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge variety. We then use the SARI reference data model uh, to, to uh, combine these this, uh, individual pieces of, of, of fields that we have to find there to a model that represents uh, the data that is incoming from collections. And this has allowed us to harmonize uh, the source data, but also to, to do so in a way that retains the detail of the original data. We use the reference data service to align entities, in particular persons, places, uh, events, but also keywords. Uh, and when we linked to existing resources, mostly the GND, which covers a lot of uh, uh, our use cases, yeah. as well as Wikidata. So this linking allowed us to um, align entities that appear across collections. For example, here, Code for Engelmann, which has works in both the collection of the Central Library as well as the Swiss National Library. And uh, this, is, this is crucial because often, you know, persons don't have the same names uh, or persons have the same names, but actually different persons. This ha happens a lot uh, when we have painters where you know the son carries the same name as the father and it's sometimes dif difficult to discriminate between them the actual uh, transformation from from the input files to uh, rdf uh, we did using a mapping file uh, created by x by the xreml mapping tool uh, some of you might be familiar with it uh, some you not but it's, it's findable and we publish it all on a research platform, which is built uh, based on the MetaFacts open source platform. And the platform itself is accessible under this URL. And you will also find most uh, parts of the pipeline in this uh, PSO data pipeline repository. So although this is not yet finished in public, we kind of went the uh, publish first approach and put everything online as early as possible. Uh, with the idea that we also discover issues and problems early on, but maybe also uh, get early feedback by <clears throat> users who explore these collections. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. Okay, then if we don't have more questions, just thank you, Florian, for your presentation. It was very interesting. We were supposed to have um, Joana Rodriguez uh, now at 6.30, to our uh, time. She's not there yet. So we are going to move 
to the next one, which is Haris Likau, Liku. Thank you, Haris, for being here today. Uh, let me introduce you, first of all. Um, Haris is a data management officer at the International Monetary Fund, uh, working on information management, reference data, and enterprise vocabularies. Previously, she has worked for the European Central Bank on IT systems related to monetary policy and commercial data. Haris is presenting in collaboration with Denisa Popescu, who is a senior data architect at the International Monetary Fund with over 20 years of experience in multi-format data architecture, reference data, and taxonomies management, semantic technologies, and enterprise search. Previously, Denisa has worked for the World Bank Group on enterprise architecture and metadata management. Um, could be that we get Denisa at certain point in time, in time, in the meantime, oh, yes, we have, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, you're sorry, here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, so thank you so much for both of you for, well, for being here today. We are excited to hear your contribution to DC, am I? And just over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. Uh, I will uh, start uh, sharing a pre-recorded um, presentation that we have, and then uh, we would like uh, to spend some time uh, with the discussion. Hello everyone, uh, we are here to present the part of our recent work on metadata for statistical data at the IMF. Uh, our work on metadata focuses on several main uh, objectives. The primary objective is building an integrated portal for both internal and external users uh, to search and browse data and related content. In the middle of this slide, you can see a view of the future IMF data portal. Uh, to do so, uh, we need to harmonize across different datasets in uh, IMF. Um, we also see that there is a tactical opportunity in implementing parts of this metadata work, uh, along with the ongoing mod modernization of the IMF's current data management platform. The core metadata elements for the statistical data should uh, not only describe the data and how the data is sourced and used, but also we need it to link the data with the related content. And um, the most challenging part was to ensure that uh, we have common definitions and common controlled vocabularies across the IMF. This work is uh, being carried out in close collaboration with the Knowledge Management Unit, uh, which manages the institutional control vocabularies. Of course, whenever that's possible, we are trying to leverage on uh, international standards. Um, as mentioned by my colleague, we are being tactical and, at and attempting to implement pieces of this core metadata as we implement a new data management platform. For the data resource, the core metadata elements may be attached at multiple levels of data where the data set level uh, metadata represents the highest level of uh, um, information. We think of data sets as a publication and as such it is at this level that we are mapping with related documents, news, videos. As we are still defining pieces of the metadata, we thought it would be a good timing to share some of the challenges and get your feedback on whether there are practices and or standards that we don't know and we can learn from. First one is the organizations. We definitely need a master organization list for several metadata attributes, such as the publisher and the data source. We have extensive coverage of organization due to the cross-country aspect of our data and uh, as we need to capture data provenance. We put considerable effort in the last few months in ensuring we have the proper organization official name and various names in different languages. And the immediate need that we have now is to have organization identifier conforming to one identification uh, system, preferably external identifier that we can use in the new data man management platform. 
Another challenge is really the country groups. Uh, exact definition of uh, analytical country groups varies from organizations to, uh, to organization and across time. There is a high demand from users of historical data and they want to know the exact definition and country composition at that point in time. And our challenge is really how to model and capture this complexity in the new system. Now, the main challenge uh, related to shores is uh, standardized data provenance. Uh, we observe uh, inconsistent practices on how, what and when to cite the data uh, in our effort to uh, comply with legal requirements. Uh, also, source consists of many components, um, access provider, original source, uh, source data set. And um, moreover, uh, as data can be derived from different sources and can be attached to different levels, uh, data classification and its mapping to access and usage rights uh, are challenging for the data management system. This, of course, comes with uh, implications on tagging, uh, incentives and resources. Uh, finally, building uh, unified economic and financial topics uh, used for documents and for the social economic indicators has been a challenge uh, as we see that users uh, of data might think differently about a certain topic. Thank you for your attention and happy to discuss and uh, answer your questions. Um, OK, so I think that perhaps um... Yes, Marcia will contact you, Denisa and Haris later, and she might talk to you. Um, so, you. yes, um, thank you, Marcia. So, um, not sure whether we have Joana Rodriguez. Um, seems like she's not here. In this case, I, what I would suggest is to say, if you have any other additional question for the speakers, um, would you like to bring something else um, to our discussion today? I hope that you enjoyed all the presentations. I did very much. They were all extremely interesting. Um, if there are no additional questions, I would simply ask all the speakers to turn on the webcams to say to you, thank you again. And it has been a pleasure to be moderating, to be moderating this session. And uh, I would suggest then that we finish our best practices two session now at 6.47 test time. I'm not sure what the time in for the rest of the audience, but uh, yes, I would suggest. Oh. Uh, and I would like to say as well, thank you so much, Nisat, for being there and supporting the moderation, technically speaking. And um, yes, so enjoy this CMI 2022 for those that will continue participating in the sessions and see you very soon. Thank you. Bye, thank you.